Penguin Random House Audio presents Nobody Will Tell You This But Me, a true, as told to me, story. This is the author, Bess Kalb. Thank you, Grandma, and for my son. Prologue I could tell this girl she'd marry the love of her life in a year. She'd leave the tenement in Brooklyn and see Cairo and Tuscany and China and Switzerland and Greece and Gaza and Paris, Paris more times than she could count. She'd visit her mother's village in Belarus, then part of Russia, the village her mother fled when she was 13 years old. And that night, she'd order a Kir Royale at the hotel bar. She'd have two worshipful sons and one daughter. Her daughter would be her spitting image, as if she were reborn. She'd teach her daughter to study harder than her sons, to speak louder, to make them laugh, to make them relax. She'd read her daughter Emily Bronte at night. Her daughter would be in the first class of women admitted to Brown. Her daughter would graduate by 20. Her daughter would say, I want to be a doctor. And she'd tell her, go be a doctor. Her daughter had never taken science. Her daughter became a doctor. Her daughter would have a daughter, me. She and I would fall in love. We'd speak in songs. My angel, my angel, you saved my life. We'd have secrets and hiding places and code words. We'd talk about our hair until we fell asleep. We'd watch old movies and read new books. We'd cry for no reason. We'd cry for every reason all at once. We'd say everything that ever occurred to us to each other, even if it was nothing or mean or so mean it was crazy. We'd eat the same foods at exactly the same rates in exactly the same ways. We never said goodbye. Always, I love you, I love you, I love you. Three times. Never enough. If you ever have a daughter, she'd tell me, I declare her a force. My funeral. It's a terrible thing to be dead. Oh, how boring. How maddening. Nothing to do, nothing to read, no one to talk to, and everyone's a mess. Thank God for that, at least. The rabbi at the service didn't know me from Adam. I didn't pay attention. I was watching your grandfather. I always hated Hebrew, Bessie. There was too much of it. But when everyone started the chants, he finally stopped crying. Fine. Good for Hebrew. I will say this. I'm more upset than any of you. The worst part was the dirt. I never understood why they make the family shovel dirt onto you. What an awful thing. I appreciate you refused, Bessie. What's next? They make the kids push the embalming fluid into my veins? Honestly, the whole thing was degrading. I'd kill your uncles for how much dirt they shoveled. Your grandfather seemed calmed by the ritual of it. And I believed him when he told me, as he poured it onto the coffin, I wish it was me, Bob. I wish it was me. My Zeta, my father's father, died at 96, older than me. He was drunk as a skunk. He went to temple that morning, drank his weight in the wine they had there, probably brought his own potato vodka too. It could dissolve paint. Then he crossed the street and a bus hit him. Bam, dead. What a way to go. When they crowded around his body, he was smiling. The bus driver says he smiled at him. Or at least that was my brother Georgie's story. The funeral was a party at the temple. Everyone got drunk and walked home and lived to tell the tale. My coffin was perfect. Absolutely perfect. Although I could have done without the Jewish star. What am I, a Zionist? All of a sudden, everyone becomes very religious on behalf of the deceased. I never understood why your mother went to the kibbutz. She had just been accepted to Columbia School of Architecture, and she had a bad feeling about the whole thing, and decided to travel to Europe. So she flew to Paris and stayed with her friend Claire, who was an au pair for a wealthy family, and she got bored almost immediately, and she met a few Jewish kids who said they were going to Israel to live in a commune and pick strawberries and smoke drugs. Heaven. So she bought a ticket to Tel Aviv the next day, She stayed in some terrible international hostel, 
and asked around and ended up getting on a bus to a banana farm in the north along the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't the type of kibbutz where they all danced around in peasant blouses and banged the tambourine and sang songs. It was a tough camp where the kids worked outside all day and drank a rack all night until they passed out in the fields and woke up with frost in their hair. Your mother arrived, and the old man in the front office had blue numbers down his arm, and he gave her a job peeling potatoes in the mess hall. Every morning, she'd wake up at dawn and put on rubber boots and stand in a cold vat full of potatoes and water, peeling them one by one and tossing them into another vat. Plunk. And in the afternoons, she rode a tractor up and down the banana fields and pitched the bunches in the sun. And her hands grew calloused and turned so brown, people at the markets would speak to her in Arabic. To her, it was paradise. She didn't have to think about architecture school. She didn't have to plan. She didn't have to worry about the boyfriend at Brown who'd asked her to get married. She didn't have to do anything but peel potatoes and ride a tractor. It was the same every day, every night, for two months. She sliced her hand open one morning and ended up in the medical tent. And the woman who patched her up was kind and funny and smart. And by the time she finished stitching her wound, your mother had decided to become a doctor. Just like that. I knew she'd be flying back to New York by way of Paris, and in one of her letters, she said she'd call on Labor Day when she got back to Claire's apartment. Labor Day came, and I didn't hear from her. No call, no telex, nothing. I woke your grandfather up at four the next morning, and I said, something is the matter with Robin. He told me not to worry. Ha, that's the last time he ever did that. On a whim, I called the American Hospital of Paris. That's the family rule. If anything happens to you when you go abroad, you go straight to the American Hospital, whatever it costs. So I called and I said, Robin Bell's room, please. And I'll never forget what I heard next. Just a moment. The longest moment of my life. And the nurse picked up and brought your mother the phone. And she said, Mom, I hung up and hit your grandfather on the head. Then I got my handbag. I got in the car and drove it to Kennedy Airport. I left the car at the curb and walked up to the ticket counter and said, one way to Charles de Gaulle. And they said, today's flight is completely full, but you can go tomorrow. And I said, I need to go now. I took out my wallet and started counting out bills. I paid double, all in cash and sat in the jump seat next to the stewardesses in the galley. I don't think I blinked the whole flight. I was by your mother's side in eight hours. She had viral encephalitis. It was in her spine. They said she might never walk. I looked at her and I said, Robin, you get up right now and you walk. So she did. Do you know what my Zeta used to say? He would look at me and say, Bubbala. When the earth is cracking behind your feet, you go forward, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. Part one, my mother, the fruit of the vine. My mother taught me exactly one thing, and it's how to make brisket. It doesn't take a genius. The key is you just leave it alone. You put the side of beef in a large pot, pour in whatever, red wine, tomatoes from a can, some carrots cut up, half an onion, a fistful of kosher salt, a potato for your grandfather, and let it sit on a very low flame. I'd pour in some water if it got too dry, but otherwise it required very little effort. You could forget about it for the entire day and there it would be. Don't say I never taught you anything. How you loved my brisket. You didn't care if it was tough. You loved the taste of the gristle on the edges and the char from the bottom of the pot. Before you came over to the house in Ardsley for Passover or break the fast or what have you, you knew there would be brisket. You'd talk about it like a fiend. Is it time for brisket yet? Grandma, is there going to be enough brisket? Always with the appetite. Your parents never made beef because of your father's cholesterol. 
so you were probably very anemic. You needed the blood running through you. Sample complete. Ready to continue? Complete. Ready to continue.